Judith Butler's first major work was Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity, which Butler wrote as a response to movements in feminism which were attempting to trouble or problematize the concept of women and to ask whether women should even be the focus of feminism. These concerns are rooted in a core question. What do people mean by woman? Is this truly a universal concept? Or does what is meant by woman change depending on the audience or the community and their own perceptions and framing of the concept of woman or even of gender itself? Now, troubling, and I, I keep using the air quotes and I'll stop in a second, but you should know this is sort of an air quote question. This, she's creating this concept, okay? So you have to think about troubling as a concept that Butler is sort of trying to create. It's, it's a framework, it's a, it's a way of viewing something. So troubling involved a constant and thoroughgoing questioning of received assumptions, which allows for new possibilities of thought and action to emerge. Troubling in Butler's construction tears down our assumptions about how we define and understand our world, thus allowing us to imagine new constructs and to open space for previously marginalized voices and perspectives to reframe the common understanding of certain definitions. So in a way, Butler's looking to break down our traditional core um, fundamental ideas of what we assume is fundamental, like what woman means or what man means. And she's saying that these um, definitions actually don't really work for a huge number of people. And because they aren't actually working for the, you know, the entirety of the human population, that we need to, we need to break them down or at least crack them a bit and create some space for the concept to um, allow in different ways of thinking um, about this and possibly expand the definition so that it actually does speak to a much wider range of people. Butler's work is highly dependent upon these kinds of moves. Examining the assumed foundations of reality and the definitions which seem immutable, unchangeable, but with a little exploration, start to seem constructed or these definitions even sometimes potentially arbitrary. As a result, her work is often seen as more controversial than what it may actually be in reality. Her work is rooted in an attempt to wrestle with biological determinism, which says where social roles and behavior are inherently linked to biological differences. So these thinkers that she's trying to work against have distinguished between binary sex, male or female, as a physical reality, something that's real and true, and binary gender, femininity or masculinity, as an issue of customs, culture, and context. So binary sex, male and female, is real, it's true, it's biological, it is, we cannot touch that, that's true. But then these other things, gender, is possibly changeable. And we've seen that, you know, it's a question of customs. Uh, history has shown us that cultural understandings of gender have changed over time. So once the sex gender distinction is acknowledged, the idea is feminists could turn to challenging the systemic inequities linked to gendered bodies. So a body of somebody who is seen as feminine versus a body that is seen as someone who's masculine. Also, they could reimagine gendered roles as they need not be biologically determined. Biological males could express aspects of feminine gender, including feminine roles and vice versa. In this way, her work is quite similar to Walker Bynum's. Now, Butler asks, who constructs the person? Is the gendered subject created by society where their gender is as fully determined by the social order as their sex was by biology? And thus, stripping them of any chance for agency or change? Or is the individual subject free to choose their own gender from a buffet of options, as if they were free from the constraints imposed by the social realm, excuse me, somehow standing outside of society? Butler found both choices to be dead ends, bound by an individualist assumption of individual choice and rationalism. Instead, Butler insisted that agency, again, the power to determine one's own way, uh, one's own path, one's own choices, originated within a subject's social, cultural, linguistic formation, the words and the language that we use, where language didn't simply describe reality, but also 
performed it, and as such constructed reality as much as it described it. Now, performed language or performative language, quote unquote, does what it says. In other words, it creates the reality which it speaks. For example, pronouncing that two people are married renders a new reality. By saying the words, the people are now changed. The authority to render this change does not lie in the role of the person making the statement, in other words, a minister or a judge, however. The, the utterance of the words of a specific convention or norm, such as marriage, and all that comes with marriage as both norm and institution, within a specific ritual context, which includes the person inhabiting the role, performs the task of making the new reality. So basically, by saying the new reality, you are creating it. And this whole context isn't just the judge saying it. The judge could say marriage, you know, you two are married in any other context, and it wouldn't actually mean anything. It's this whole context of a marriage ceremony itself. And having some person say it, that is what creates the reality of the marriage itself. In other words, the language performs the task of remaking reality. Norms also need to be cited or reiterated in order to have any compelling power to make what is stated real. In other words, it is only by continually saying the words, I now pronounce you and you as married over and over and over in a ritual framework that the norm of marriage is defined as real, as a different reality and status, bounded off from being unmarried. It is by speaking the words of the norm, by saying you are married in this whole context, that they have the power to make the norm of marriage itself real. You create marriage by saying marriage over and over again. The process of citation, this saying, reiterating, it disguises our dependence, the, the, the dependence of norms themselves on the process itself. It disguises how important the, um, the creation of a norm, let's say marriage, is um, how much that depends upon actually saying the words. That marriage just doesn't exist up there in some some space in, in in you know in the world. It is actually something which is real and which you know must be created by saying it. The process of citation disguises dependence of norms on the process itself. Since the norms are continuously cited, they take on a sense of a fixed reality or a given which cannot be questioned. Yet the fact the norm needs to be performed opens a space for critique. The norm is not reiterated or cited exactly the same time each time. Each recitation, I now pronounce you and you married, can be faithful to the form, but it's never an exact repetition. It could be said to be open space for mutation and change. Now, how this relates back to sex and gender. Butler argues that sex, biological sex, and that determinism thing that we talked about, does not produce gender. Instead, gender produces sex. Masculinity, femininity, these gender things are learned performances, which masquerade seem to be natural because they use bodily markers, sex characteristics, voice tone, location of body hair, genital shape, etc. As a biological or embodied, literally, I have facial hair, therefore, I am, it is true that I am biologically male. Yet biological sex is way more complicated and ambiguous than that. Butler refers to this using a call-response dynamic, akin to when a person is hailed by a policeman. If the person responds by turning around, they are, they become the one who called, or the one who is called, sorry. By responding, they become someone who is already guilty. The act of call-response by me saying as a cop, hey, and you turning around, that in a sense frames me now immediately as guilty. Similarly, Butler states that humans engage in the same process. They are named as boy or girl, and with every subsequent recitation of the norms around boy and girl in the practices, dress, even bodily shape of the person, society marks its expectations on the child's body 
Society tells the child's body how to act, and the child responds by how it builds and conceives, imagines its own physical boundaries and possibilities. So the child, by society telling it what to be, in a sense, is creating its own understanding of what their body should even feel like and look like. Thus, social norms reside within the child's own body and are manifested in their performance as a gendered and sexed self. The performative process is thus also a process of materialization. Performance is enacted on the material body itself. Now, this process is ex exclusionary, exclusionary, excuse me. Social norms define the acceptable bounds of intelligible and viable subjectivity, which basically just means acceptable and understandable ways of being and expressing one's personhood and sense of self. Anything outside of these norms is rejected as unacceptable, unnatural, and not making sense. So one must be, you know, norms define what is acceptable masculinity and who gets to perform that, and the same for femininity. And anything outside of those acceptable bounds is seen as performing it incorrectly or um, as potentially even immoral or not even making rational sense. The boundaries are strenuously and vigorously policed, often with violent disciplinary measures which make life in these margins unbearable or even impossible. Now, using the frame of performativity, how we perform and create things, uncovers the dependence of this system, this gender system, on sighting to work, on being repeated over and over and over again. Our gender identities are actually simply cultural frameworks imposed upon reality. These are frameworks, these, these are ideas that are then imposed upon our material bodies. We don't simply become female by being born with certain sex characteristics. Instead, we must learn how to occupy our bodies in certain ways and not others. We learn through watching women walk, dress, move, prepare their look, and act in a variety of situations. Much of this learning process is unconscious, so our gender performances are mainly unconscious as well. Unless we unmask this system, unless we get at the, the heart of it and began to begin to act consciously, we, we, we begin to consciously create our own understanding of what gender is or is not. Now, Butler's work was obviously quite influential on queer theory and politics for obvious reasons. The challenge, however, and this is a huge critique of Butler's work, came with the realization that her work was not as intersectional as queer theorists and activists needed it to be. She attempted to respond to these critics, yet many trans critics found the insistence on language dismissed the, the power that bodily reality and embodiment had on framing the trans experience, and a critique from disability scholars as well. 